last two decades have really been about trying to understand science um, as something that is socially and historically situated. But um, very often, certainly me, when I was trained um, within the biological sciences, I understood the sciences as trying to produce what we call big T truth about the world. And with time, I have come to understand that science is done by scientists and scientists are very much part of the cultural and historical moment of their times. And scientific disciplines are very much a product of their histories. And nearly all academic disciplines are really implicated in the histories of colonialism. So part of the colonial project, which was about fundamentally about resource extraction, um, required botany. So much of the botanical theories, uh, botanical ideas um, come from that colonial legacy. And so my interest, so my previous work really has been about trying to um, theorize and understand how science and society uh, are, are implicated in the histories of the biological sciences. And so, um, and my um, most recent book, uh, Holy Science, um, was about, oh, so maybe I should backtrack. So um, I teach in a women, gender, sexuality studies department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, I'm trained um, at, with a PhD in evolutionary biology. And soon after graduate school, I got really interested in uh, understanding the histories uh, of evolutionary biology, um, because it became clear that the ways in which we educate students, the ways in which curriculum is structured, have larger, deeper colonial legacies. And so I've spent the last two decades doing that. And my last book, uh, Holy Science, was um, the book before that was called Ghost Stories for Darwin. And that's the one where I think I really try to understand locating the biological sciences um, within these histories of eugenics in that particular book. And in holy science, I was really, I came to understand how colonial legacies have shaped biology, not and that biology has been shaped by the colonial legacy. So they always go uh, both ways. And so in this new work, I've been thinking about, so if but the biological sciences have been shaped by these colonial legacies, what do we do about them? Um, how has that shaped and how does it continue to shape the knowledge that we produce about the natural world? Um, and so, you know, that's where this, um, this project um, comes from. And so I'm just going to sort of pre present a kind of overview, both some of the theoretical foundations and then give you more in terms of a, a case study to tell you more. And my interest actually in this project, um, one of the, um, in, in this uh, decolonizing botany, I'm thinking in terms of three subfields within botany that I'm examining. One is looking at invasion biology, which is mostly what I'm gonna talk about today. One is looking at reproductive biology and the third looking at systematics and taxonomy. And my interest in invasion biology really came with reading newspapers and seeing this idea of bad plants, invasive plants, that they are the reason for problems in the environmental, um, the, the, you know, our environments across the globe. And I think this is true of most countries in the world. And beginning to think about what makes something native or alien. And um, here is a quintessential, what is seen as a, you know, the icon of the American, if you watch Western films, um, that is a tumbleweed. And the tumbleweed is actually Russian in origin, but yet in the United States, it is understood as this icon of the West. So if you watch any Western films, you'll see this tumbleweed, like a ball rolling down, um, you know, down a road. And so I got interested in why do some things like the tumbleweed become icons of a nation, or if you think of um, the, um, the Georgia peach, which is the state fruit of Georgia. Why did that, even though it comes from China, versus other plants are seen as terrible, as invasive, as exotic. 
right? So what makes something belong or not belong? And it turns out that the answer is something more complicated than um, mere, mere geography. And so it turns out that nearly, you know, all these things of these, the, um, the horse, um, um, the cattle, so all the iconography of the so-called American cowboy um, really comes from, uh, are not American, right? But somehow they've gotten the, um, they've become embraced as something quintessentially American. And of course, I want to, you know, begin always by acknowledging um, where I live, given that the United States is a settler colonial nation. I am today speaking from Arlington, Massachusetts, which is the original homeland of the Pawtucket people. And the reason I do this is if we are talking seriously about decolonizing, then we need to understand what settler colonialism has done and how did we get here and how can we be accountable for our part in history? And that's sort of what I'm hoping to lay out in the talk here. And so to think about colonization and the project of colonization, I find this quote by Leanne Simpson um, sort of very succinct. And what she argues is really what the colonizers have always been trying to figure out is how do you extract natural resources from the land and the peoples whose territory you're on believe, right? And that, that they believe that those plants and animals have both spirit and agency. So what you do, she argues, is you use gender violence to remove indigenous people and their descendants from the land. You remove agency from the plant and animal world and you reposition the land as natural resources for the use and betterment of white people, right? So there are three things. One is removing people from their land and their descendants from their land, taking agency so that plants and animals, which very often had agency, had pronouns, were living creatures in the cultures of many native people, they all became it. Right, they lost pronouns, they lost agency, and so they became things that could be exploited by um, the colonists. And finally, they become natural resources that help the colonial enterprise. And so fundamentally, colonialism is a story of violence, a teeming inventive life on, decimated, off, on earth decimated, cleaved into hierarchies of human and non-human, superior and inferior, master and slave, native and alien, colonizer and colonized. We have rendered a vital, vibrant planet into desolate landscapes of cracked and crushed earth, an ecological apocalypse of pillaged lands and peoples through slavery and em empire. So in telling this story, and this is a feminist story, um, one of the critical moments is to acknowledge that there is no abstract Anthropocene. So there is no humanity that is an abstract entity, rather that we should understand humanity in its sexually and racially stratified anthropos. And so really the story we are telling is how some anthropos colonized, conquered, enslaved, enslaved and dehumanized other anthropos. And in the story of colonialism, they conquered, dehumanized, extracted the resources and retur returned home with their rich spoils to build fortresses, and then enact borders, not allowing new people to come in. So this is really story of European colonization. Through conceptual landscapes of gender, race, class, indigeneities, and these binaries of sex, gender, native alien, homosexual, heterosexual, colonizer, colonized, science has created biopolitical landscapes of inferior and superior bodies. Like the original colonists, modern science in the name of rectifying the horrors of the past has in fact recolonized rather than decolonized. Through a politics of purity, fields like conservation biology, restoration ecology, reproductive biology, seed and germplasm, these savior sciences preserve the legacies of empire. In short, we have transformed the majestic deep history of planetary time of the plant, plant world into the reductionist linear time of a botanical world. It is this transformation of plant worlds into the field of botany that interests me here. Today, plant worlds are botany. Plant lovers use botanical knowledge every day. So what do we do with this horrendous legacy? How do we reckon 
with our love of plants and botany and their deep entanglements in the histories of colonialism, conquest, and slavery. If botany is a powerful site that has showed up a normative nature, mobilized as a potent source for the management and recuperation of white Western patriarchy, how do we decolonize botany and our love for plants? And so here I want to offer some reflections uh, as seeds for a decolonial botany, and I'm doing that in three parts. Part one, coming to a life in botany. So I was born and I grew up in India and benefited from a post-colonial education from elementary school through the end of my undergraduate years. Growing up in India, the plant world was forever enchanted. Plants, their roots, shoots, leaves, flowers were woven into mythological and folk tales. Um, never immobile, unintelligent beings, plants were active agents in fantastical stories. Plants housed transmigrated souls of divine human and other sentient beings. For example, the sweet, fragrant jasmine was believed to have emerged from the churning of the ocean of milk. The tamarind tree and its sour fruit housed myriad spirits, and we were always told, don't sit under it. Whispering into the wind, trees communicated with the world around. Reproduction was not grounded in sex, heterosexuality, or heteronormative reproduction. Sex and gender were mutable. Bodies emerged from tissues, from desire, through necessity, through longing, through invocation to the gods. Plants were essential and ubiquitous as digestives, health aids, beauty remedies, games, musical instruments. So once I entered school in India, a botanical education then produced a, a project of disenchantment from the natural world. I had to learn Latin names by rote, and these erased the luxurious and magical context of my childhood. They severed plants from the world I lived and knew. But we were assured that it was scientific. So this botanical uh, nomen, you know, binomial nomenclature was something we all had to study and we had to be able to identify um, plants around us in this Linnaean uh, system of um, classification. Universality was very, and we were, it was argued that we were doing this because this was a universal system. And so really universality is important to those who can travel, who have access to other lands and knowledge systems. Botany as a result, its universal terminology seemed as a young child to me, sterile, abstract, absolute, and without context. A study in botany and its Latin nomenclature was a study in alienation from the natural world around me. Um, an American author, Jamaica Kincaid, who I, uh, whose work I really, uh, like and have been in, um, influenced by. This is just a funny cartoon about why it's important to, um, to under have terminology in context to understand the world around us. And so J Jamaica Kincaid talks about, she, she grew up in uh, one of the West Indian islands of Antigua, and she talks about how um, she also had a British style education that she had to study. And she um, talks about you know, having to memorize this poem, Daffodils, by William Wordsworth, and she writes, In my child's mind's eye, the poem and its contents, and the people through whom it came, were repulsive. I had no rational or just way of arranging and separating the people who created the things to memorize from the people who made me memorize wonderful things, whether they were about daffodils, heaven, and hell, or just the River Thames. Uh, and in a novel, Lucy, subsequently, she has a character who uh, comes and who was forced to study this poem and then comes across the fields of daffodils. And Lucy writes, I wanted to kill them. I wish that I had an enormous sight that I could walk down the path, dragging it along me, alongside me. And I would cut these flowers down at the place where they emerged from the ground. So this is really startling for anyone, especially in the United States, which is the first time I saw daffodils. Um, after a winter in the spring, these are one of the first plants that um, come out and they are beautiful and really a sign of spring and life. But what Jamaica Kincaid contrasts is, it is a context in which one is forced to produce knowledge that one never sees, right? That th this is part of the legacies of colonialism that live on in many post-colonial nations. And so it's really important to understand botany because it is implicated 
in poetry, it's implicated in plants, it is implicated in what we read, in the spice trade, in economics. So really botany is a field that goes across. And so we need to understand these histories um, as, we, um, as they in, uh, they're implicated in our lives. And as uh, Jamaica Kincaid argues, this naming of things is so crucial, a spiritual padlock with the key thrown irretrievably away that it is a murder and erasing. This legacy of capturing and renaming nature leaves the post-colonial writer in the position of having to renegotiate the terms of taxonomy, struggling to articulate new relationships and new meanings in the tired old language of empire. So I want to give you some basic tools from this field I uh, work on, you know, feminist science and technology studies. And in particular, I want to focus on the idea of objectivity and why we should understand objectivity within this historical context and the politics of knowledge. So most often, and certainly when I was trained, I was taught to see science as outside of culture, right? So if you look at figure A, and that somehow scientists by some miraculous uh, moment, are, you know, they enter their lab doors and suddenly the world they inhabited, the cultural understandings they had miraculously stayed away and they could enter this world of science, um, what Donna Haraway calls the view from nowhere, right? And it's a God's trick that somehow the scientific method or the institution of science is able to put culture outside, put history outside, and that science is sometimes that is seen as completely outside of it all. Rather, feminist science and technology studies would argue, and I, I'm happy to talk more about this, there's a very vast literature um, that would argue that science should be seen as, under, as understood within culture, that science is produced by scientists who bring all the cultural understandings and biases um, into their theories, into their experiments, and into the ways in which they interpret their experiments. And so rather than understand nature and culture as two separate zones, we should understand it as one word, nature cultures. Because if you look historically, theories move from nature to culture, back to nature, science to society, back to science, right? And so we, we see a circulation of knowledge rather than a unidirectional um, movement of knowledge or a science outside of culture. So certainly within the United States, if you take a category like race, it's not a category that has not changed, right? It's constantly changing. And it's constantly changing because science you know, is produced by scientists. And as political politics changes, as laws change, these have shaped biological understandings of race. And so things like gender, or sexuality, or ideas of alien, or what a gene is, all these profoundly scientific ideas shift over time. And so rather than understanding them as static, immobile categories, we should understand them as nature cultures uh, and as things that, that are co continually transformed as our politics and cultural understandings shape. And so I want to use the case study of um, invasion biology to talk about um, of, of understanding the diasporic lives of empire. So why botany? Three decades into the development of the vibrant fields of feminist SDS, the colonial, racial, and gender dimensions of biology have now been well articulated. Learning to explore the world from a disciplinary perspective is what disciplinary education enables. It is something that is reproduced generationally, it's taught, it's learned, it's rehearsed, it's practiced, it's remembered and then replicate it endlessly. And this includes these binaries of um, you know, nature and culture. And part of what I'm arguing in invasion biology is that it is a profound amnesia that forgets the histories of colonialism that we name things as exotic, foreign, or alien, or invasive. So if you look at the field of invasion biology, it was a new subfield that really emerged in the 1980s. And so if you look at um, the US Department of Agriculture, they define invasion species 
as introduced species that thrive in areas beyond their natural range. So fundamentally, by definition, invasive species have to be foreign species, right? Even though they may be native species that get unruly, but they are not seen as invasive species. So it's fundamentally a question of geography. In the last few decades, the field of invasion biology has exploded. A frenzy of xenophobic alarm by groups from the political right and left, from environmentalists and non-environmentalists alike, has spawned a veritable industry of bioinvasion, an entire academic, policy-oriented and activist field. It has proved a fertile ground for large investments of money, attention and resources into research, policy and activism. The National Science Foundation in the US has created committees and grants. There are lots of scientific and popular publications that are devoted to bioinvasion. There is an, indeed, there are journals on that topic and state and local governments have, implement, have policies and environmental groups like Greenpeace, Sierra Club, Nature Conservancy, all have robust programs in invasion biology. Now the idea of invasion biology is predicated on a binary view of nature in place and nature out of place. This growing internationalist interest in the field has stoked alarm, and it's really the alarm is about a world out of place. Cultural theorists argue that this hyperbole about alien species resembles germ panics of the past, and is best understood as a cultural panic about changing economic, racial, and gender norms in the nation. The perceived globalization of markets and the real and perceived lack of local control feed nationalist discourse. These shifts continue to be interpreted by elements of both the right and the left as a problem of immigration. Thus, immigrants and foreigners, products of the global, are perceived as one of the key reasons for the problems in the local. Indeed, during crimes of xenophobia, we see a rise in xenophobic narratives of people, of plants and animals. And I think uh, both in the United States and Germany, I think we are going through um, a period where there is a real fear of the foreigner and the politics of immigration loom large. So to just give you a few examples, um, this is a children's book about exotic invaders, killer bees, fire ants, and other alien species are infesting America. And so we start very young in, um, in, in training children um, to be wary of the foreigner. And this is another book, Thinking with Eden, A Natural History of Exotics in America. Again, this idea that there was this mythical Eden in the past where everything was beautiful and lovely and humans existed um, in Edenic land and plants and animals got together and then the foreigners came and exotics um, transformed this Eden into a modern day wasteland. Especially post 9-11 in America, the language of invasion and wars are all over how we talk about plants and animals as well. So everything becomes about wars that need to be fought by battles and um, aggressively. Um, uh, the, again, this idea of that they are the invasive species are threatening, um, they are evolved to conquer. So again, these very violent rhetoric of, of um, that the natives, this, about the natives being besieged, right? That the natives need to worry about these foreigners because they're here to take over the planet. Again, this idea of aliens, which, you know, um, seems very much like sci-fi in the ways in which it gets talked. And fundamentally, this is seen as a problem of globalization and the fact that we need stronger borders. So the problem is a bio-invasion in a borderless world. And so these rhetorics really are about um, closing down nations and building borders. And so the language of biosecurity um, has loomed large, not only with respect to um, germ warfare, but also with respect to uh, plants and animals. So as I was looking at um, not only scientific articles, but also looking at newspaper magazines, the, it was very striking the ways in which we talked about them. So here are some headlines. Alien invasion, they're green, they're mean, and they may be taking over a park or preserve near you. Aliens wreaking havoc. Creepy strangler climbs Oregon's least wanted list. Alien threats. 
invasive species pathogens of globalization. What is striking to me anyway in, in all these headlines, which come from major newspapers, is not a single one of them is telling you that this is about a plant or animal, right? It could be about any alien of any species. And so there are ways in which how we talk about the foreign looms large, whether it's about foreign people, plants, or animals. And so this is this um, generalized um, fear of the foreign, the xenophobia that is the moment we live in. And when I was looking across how we talk about human plants and animals, there is a, there's a, there's a similar way in which how we talk across species. They're all unhygienic, disease, damage, threat. The, the aliens are seen as other. They look visibly weird or foreign. They're taking over everything, but they're doing this very silently. They're indestructible. And here's the quintessential um, trope of the oversexed third world female, right, that they, they uh, reproduce too much. And again, you see this with respect to plants. They're here to stay, uh, and they will cause irreversible change. They're economically and e ecologically destructive, and they come in unlawfully. And so in none of these is there any positive um, aspect for of immigrants or immigration. And you see this across um, uh, different species. And this is one of my favorite titles. They came, they bred, they conquered. Right, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very pithy summary of the generalized fear of invasive species. Now, if you look at historians who um, talk about, um, look, look at the history of um, imperialism, they argue that we should understand imperialism as fundamentally an ecological project in which humans, plants, and other species were shuffled around the world in schemes for colonization and conservation. In the very modern period, botany was big science and big business, critical to Europe's ambitions as a colonial trader. Colonialism ushered in a massive and grand reshuffling of global biota, and it would be accurate to characterize colonial expansion. Really, that was the original bio invasion. And the botanical science does have a significant legacy in the afterlives of empire. Colonialism fueled an extractive economy through the objectification, commodification of the colonized world, and they destroyed local knowledges you know, in the process to then put in this universal science of botany um, in post-colonial world. And even while they, the colonists took plants you know, to every uh, colonized nation that they went to, Similarly, during that time in the US, you see a very laissez-faire attitude to uh, for plant mobility. So this invasion biology that we're going through at the moment is, is a very new discipline. So if you look 100 years ago, someone like David Fairchild himself introduced about 112,000 species into the US, right? So something changed. And if you look at the American acclimatization society, someone said, why don't we introduce every bird named in Shakespeare's plays into New York Central Park? And they did, right? So again, something is different about our current moment um, as compared to this history. So Alfred Crosby argues that the roots of European domination of the Western world lie in their creating new Europe wherever they went. Settler colonists ravaged native populations of plants, humans, and animals. Where Europeans went, their agriculture and animals went. They thrived while indigenous ecosystems collapsed. The mass export of resources out of the colonies and the growing ravages of the environment through unchecked industrialization and logics of development shaped the afterlives of empire into continuing colonial logics through ne neo-colonial policies and programs. In the context of the history of empire, the rise of the discourses of invasive species is particularly ironic. As colonialism ushered in new landscapes of empire and new formations of nature cultures, nativist thinking re-engaged with national borders with immigration and quarantine laws that restricted ent entry into the foreign. So here is um, you know, the anti-Chinese sentiment that emerges um, in California. And what is interesting is the quarantine laws come uh, one year before um, the uh, uh, the um, Chinese Exclusion Act, and subsequently you see national immigration laws that prevent the entry of foreigners um, into the United States. 
the reinvention of the United States where the white settler colonists are the real natives is particularly poignant. Indeed, while the powerful have only now discovered an impending apocalypse, the colonizers have long lived through apocalyptic nightmares of settler and neocolonialism and the devastation of our ecosystems worldwide. By this, I'm not suggesting that uh, we do not have environmental problems or that we have not decimated the problem, uh, you know, decimated um, our environment. But what I'm suggesting is that the focus on invasive species and going and pulling out invasive species is misidentifying the problem, right? Rather than thinking about overdevelopment, the cutting of trees, um, the ways in which we have managed our ecosystems, rather than focusing on that, the focus becomes about invasive species and at least in the United, United States, you know, where you have weekend calls by environmental organizations to go pull uh, invasive weeds outside. Understanding the world as dynamic nature cultures reminds us that despite our cultural predilection for nostalgia, the biota of the world had their own agency and propelled their own evolutionary futures. Botanical nostalgia is fundamentally an unecological project. We do not and cannot control the world even if we wish to. Rather, a true biological reckoning would acknowledge that we are all migrants now, all refugees of a ravaged nature cultural past, seeking to salvage our nature cultural present and futures. The constructions of natives, aliens, migrants, and refugees are all political constructions in the afterlives of empire. The ravages of empire have transformed not only human and cultural landscapes, but also ecological ones. So no species is well adapted anymore. The rise of the global right bespeaks a global anxiety about place. But rather than focus on nativism, thinking in and out of empire reminds us that we are all adapted to worlds that no longer exist as home. Indeed, the world that might feel home might be thousands of miles away on another continent. Reckoning with the false borders and boundaries of nations and nationalisms are not only about human worlds, but indeed all the co-inhabitants of the world, the plants and animals around us. Examining botany, loving plants, means taking up and taking on the vocabulary and conceptual landscapes of botany as a global universalized system. A herbarium is a collection of dead plants, dried and mounted on sheets along with their botanical nomenclature. As the botanical sciences developed, herbaria and herbarian samples grew across the world. The skeleton of the plants, its nomenclature, comes to represent what it is. The plant is its Latin name. As I've explored the entangled histories of life on Earth, the herbarium seems an impoverished site to tell the story of life on Earth. We need to displace the dead metaphor and the system of the herbarium as the central marker of plant nomenclature. Instead, we should move to the metaphor and method of what Mariana Sigilska and Olga Chimilskaya coin the plantarium, a multidimensional perspective on uneasy plant-human relations rooted in concrete stories that reveal local botanical knowledges while reflecting the planetary consciousness. In the plantarium, we tell the story of plants not in their anatomical precision at death, but with their living histories, ecologies, and evolutions that produce them. In the plantarium, we highlight the histories, political economies, and the extractive logics of plantations, undergird the disciplinary logics of plants and the nature cultural world we have inherited. In such alternate genealogies and the teeming cosmologies of cultures across the world, other genealogies left. To decolonize botany, we must respect the land we all stand on. We need to imagine a world where people give thanks to the land. Instead, we need to also imagine what Robin Kimura insists, more than ecological restoration, the restoration of the relationship between plants and people. We must dream and work towards a time when we don't only give thanks to the land, but act in ways that the land might give thanks to the people. Thank you. I will stop here for now. And I'm happy to take um, questions, comments, criticisms, clarifications.
Yeah, thank you, Banu, so much for your talk. It was very interesting. And so, yeah, if anybody has any questions, yeah, just feel free to ask. You can just unmute yourself if you want. You can raise your hand or put uh, put the question in the chat. As you can tell, this was a, a very, very big topic and I decided to do more informally. So I don't know if all the ideas came through. So feel free to um, bend. Um, yes, I don't know if you can hear me. Hello. Yes. Um, Hi. Thank you very much for the talk. I, I think it's really, I mean, from a student's perspective, but I would also agree on many points sort of re thinking maybe how we understand nature and how we understand ecosystems maybe especially as people from natural science sort of broaden our view and see that we're also subjective beings and we bring sort of a cultural background and that maybe yeah the classical natural science view is very very narrow and doesn't actually capture maybe what people well what also scientists maybe you know feel and think and value in nature so it really it's only like a very very small facet of what life is so uh, maybe but also like playing a devil's devil's advocate a bit i was wondering what do you feel was maybe departing from plants a bit um about like invasive species that maybe in island ecosystems or in sort of very fragile ecosystems have very detrimental effects for many native species or other species maybe also departing from invasive just new species so where they actually have a very big maybe also negative you know socio-economic or socio-ecological or cultural impact um, so what's your take on these kind of species? How, how would you engage with those? Yeah. That's a really fabulous question. And um, so there's, and as Ben suggests quite rightly, um, island bi biogeography is really in, in a way, uh, you know, a subfield. And um, in, in islands, some of these ecological um, patterns um, are much more intense. Um, so, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think the, they, you know, when you go back and look at the histories of how these individual invasive species came in, so take something like kudzu in the United States. It came because the U.S. Department of Agriculture had a problem of, they were worried about erosion of soil. And they paid farmers to plant kudzu to prevent soil erosion. And then decades later, you know, it, uh, it takes off. And now we, you know, most people don't know that history of how it is kudzu came to the US and that's the US government, humans within the country created the problem that we're facing. Similarly, if you look at rabbits in Australia, right? So the, a lot of these cases are, were bad ecological management where we brought in the invasive species because we wanted to solve another ecological problem. And then of course, you know, things go all right. So I think it's that historical context that I feel, so, so now it becomes like, oh, those foreigners are really terrible rather than how did they come to be here in the first place, right? So, and, and really that as ecologists that we have to take some responsibility for this history and not you know, move it onto this object, so-called foreign species. And so my concern is that this idea of just blaming the foreign species is doing a lot of damaging political work, right? About creating a generalized fear of immigration, which is, you know, which is a very human problem, certainly in the US and I suspect in Germany as well. And so there are a lot of politics that are working here. So we may think we're only talking about that beetle or just talking about kudzu, but the ways in which these get rhetorically framed is really about a larger xenophobic moment. So I'm, and so again, I'm not trying to say these are, there aren't problems in the world, but I think we need to historicize them and take responsibilities for them. And, you know, despite that history now, when you think of climate change, we are always trying to solve technological problems with new technologies, right? So this idea of let's do geoengineering, let's go put things in the sky without talking about the, you know, these ideas of unlimited growth that we continue living with, right? So we don't challenge our histories or think about the ways we live. We always want to solve the problems with new technologies which create new problems. And so thinking about that history, I think will help us um, 
will give us some uh, maybe humility in how we intervene in the world. But I, your point is very well taken. Yes, thank you. That was a very nice answer. And maybe to add, I think also this sort of more militaristic language, it makes it harder to then like switch around as a society and maybe like value a novel species or a new species. Like, I mean, there's, for example, great novel new species that you can forage yeah. in Germany, but you know, they get a yeah. bad reputation because they're new. And I think- Exactly, yeah. That's like you can value yeah. them and also. i think yeah agreed and i think some of you were talking about uh, how um, i think part of this group where you try to eat uh, these uh, eat certain uh, plant species so for example in the us there is a big problem of um, the asian carp and so it turns out the asian carp is a delicacy in china and it's been overfished there so you can't get asian carp there but no one in the US wants to eat Asian carp. So now they are, you know, catching them and sending them to China. Right. So again, it is about how we don't live with the world that we live around, in, you know, live with the world, world around us. And that there are many habitats where native species are no longer adapted to live there. And so at least something is growing and enriching that soil. So there's a whole you know, group or uh, a group that is talking about the values of um, these founder populations that are enriching the soil because something is growing there. And so we need different vocabulary, different languages to explain this, uh, the world that we're living in now. Tiago? Uh, yes, hi. Good to hi. see you. Yeah, good to see you, Bano. Thanks, thanks for this talk and thanks for the Basis Group and for organizing. I had a question who, um, I think my question relates to one of the questions in the chat that Lucas is asking. Um, so Lucas is asking, uh, what methods do you use or suggest for nature, culture, uh, knowledge construction? And my question was about methods and also about um, interdisciplinarity. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about interdisciplinarity and methods in your work. And I was thinking about this also because in your book, uh, Ghost Stories for Darwin, uh, you make a very striking point about the need for interdisciplinarity, right? So that we can better sense and grasp, grasp the ghosts of race and eugenics in studies of variation. Um, and uh, this group here in Göttingen, they also have dealt with the legacy of a racial anthropologist and naturalist uh, called Blumenbach, who is kind of also of like, a ghost, <laughs> like a ghost, like a ghost, in the university and also a name giver of an institute. So, um, and I was thinking also given that the university education in Germany in biology is very little interdisciplinary, if you could talk uh, to a little bit about that. Um, thank sure. you. No, thank you. It's a very, very big and very important question. And I don't know if I have any you know, easy answers, but certainly um, I think one place to start is that our disciplines are much too narrow, much too um, focused, and we don't understand the histories of our disciplines. And to some extent, I would argue it's not accidental, right? How else can we go on about the world pretending no history exists, right? And that is why we can continue doing the work we do is because we don't understand those histories. The minute we understand those histories and understand these interconnections, I think we will do very different kinds of academic projects than we currently do. So first is just a, you know, a fundamental re-education. And for me, as someone who, you know, it, it's taken me almost, a, you know, working on my own, a second degree to re-educate myself. Um, I grew up in India, which, you know, has a British style education. So after 10th standard or 10th grade, I did not study the humanities or social science. I started specializing in the sciences. So I, at least in the United States through undergraduate, and I think in Germany too, you take humanities, and so, which is good. Um, and so for me, I feel I had a lot of catch up work to do. And I'm just really shocked by the things no one ever told me, the things I never studied. And um, I was lucky that my um, advisor in graduate school, you know, signed off on my cards to take courses in um, women and gender studies. 
there were a lot of my friends whose advisors said, if you have so much time, spend more time in the lab or spend more time in the field. Why do you want to study, you know, history or philosophy that has nothing to do with biology? So these, you know, these disciplines are so policed and so enforced. And so grounded in the understanding that history does not matter, culture doesn't matter, politics don't matter, that we can, you know, sit in our bubbles and study them. So take a, you know, a, a project, like, let's take something like invasion biology. Um, so one of the first things for me are the questions of variable. So coming, you know, if you think interdisciplinarily, you will ask the question, what makes a native plant? Something that came here 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, right? And then you figure out this is a kind of loosey-goosey character. You know, it's, it's not based on, you know, a particular date. And I don't know if all biologists will, all, will ever agree on what that date is, right? But yet, it carries a lot of power to call something native and to call something exotic. And I think a lot of such biological um, traits or characteristics are quite nimble, right? And they, but they're doing a lot of work when you, um, so one of the things I would say that a good humanities education forces you is to think about words. And, um, and so uh, I think thinking through botanical terminology, not only their history, but what, you know, how, how are these words operating? And then to understand why do certain questions become big at certain moments and other questions don't, right? And very often I think the answer is the larger question, right? The la what is happening in the world that certain fields are funded more, certain questions are seen as more urgent. And so what kind of work is that doing? So if I produce work on invasive species, how is that intervening in these larger politics? Who is it supporting? So that as scientists, I think we need to be cognizant. We need to be asking those kinds of questions of the life our ideas have outside of academia. And nearly always, you know, I think they have very powerful work. And similarly for people in the humanities and social sciences, to take the sciences seriously, to ask these kinds of questions, because ultimately we are all living in a world with plants and animals around us. All of this should matter to all of us. Um, and so, uh, and I, so I think, you know, for those of you who are interested in interdisciplinary work, there is so much that needs to be done. And some of it is because our disciplines have become so specialized to do interdisciplinary work is not easy. You almost need a re-education. And so all of you as um, students, you are really well poised to continue to study across different fields and to ask these kinds of questions that rarely get asked within disciplines, right? So I'm just looking forward to all the brilliant work all of you are going to produce since you're thinking about these questions so early. Anna? Hi, um, thank you for your talk, it was so great. Um, uh, I would like to ask you um, what the feedback is that you get from colleagues in science or um, uh, in other fields, um, because I think um, your topic is um, very much related you know, um, to feminism and racism. And even though I think our culture is very much develop, developing and um, taking steps in the right action uh, in the right um, in the um, uh, to the right places, um, I think there's still so much work to do. And I can imagine that um, you are sometimes maybe still facing um, problems um, with that kind of uh, things or reactions that aren't always welcoming to your um, work you've done. Um. You know, as you would probably guess, it, the response is varied. I've been actually pleasantly surprised by um, the, um, by I think more and la you know, a positive response from people who really want to see things change, who really want to take on these questions. And I think from the beginning for me, these are not 
questions only about biology or botany. These are questions about us all. And I think it's really, really important that we all take on these questions as urgent questions, because I would argue much of the problems we are facing with respect to climate change are about those histories of colonialism, of extractive you know, um, re resource gathering, and this idea that context doesn't matter. I can just pull whatever I want, take it wherever, wherever I want. But that history has created a very different set of ecologies, right? Where we are thinking very short term and not thinking long term. Um, so, I mean, at some point, I guess what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter. And while I hope people will like my work, um, you know, within the sciences, I don't know that I. It, that's the final question. I think there are a lot of interdisciplinary scholars who are deeply engaged in these questions and who, you know, so those are the people I feel I work with and talk with. And I feel this work needs to go on. Uh, so Miro has this question about reintroduction of native plants that become extinct. Um, So to me, part of the, um, there is something about what we do in, um, you know, in these germplasm banks or these seed banks. It's like, oh, the species is going extinct. Let us take, you know, take some of it and stick it in this bank. So this idea of biodiversity, which is really about just counting things. And so if we can count them, then everything is okay with the world. I, I find this you know, that framing rather um, deep, deeply problematic, rather than thinking more in terms of the health of ecosystems, the health of plant communities, rather than just counting whether something goes extinct or not. Um, so I, I, I would like, I, I personally would like us to shift beyond just counting numbers um, and extinctions to thinking more broadly of how we can sustain more vibrant um, more vibrant ecosystems, rather than just saving one plant here or one plant there, which again becomes this very focused individualistic enterprise, rather than thinking in terms of community ecologies. Well, the post-colonial tour sounds wonderful that Alma was talking, so I'm just going through the questions. Um, So this is really interesting about conservation biology that Alexi is talking about. And this is something I did not realize until I got into the field, but conservation biology is a colonial field. And part of it, it, uh, it so I, I would really recommend reading Richard Bro, um, the, one of the books that I uh, put up, um, Green Imperialism, and part of, um, what he argues is that as colonists were cutting down forests, extracting resources and taking them back, there was a real concern of how do we keep producing more forests, right? If we just cut it all down, then that will be the end of it. And so really conservation biology emerges as a colonial uh, you know, project to keep growing them. And so to me, a lot of the basic tenets of conservation biology are, to me are deeply problematic these frames of invasion biology, um, you know, sort of the ways in which we understand nature as a site of resources. So, so I think we need to look more deeply into the field of conservation biology and understand its roots um, within colonialism. I don't know how you pronounce R-I-E-K-E, -E, who has a hand up? Yeah, one, one second, I start my video. Yeah, it's uh, Rike, it's how very you, difficult. How do you pronounce your name? Rike. Rika? It's very, very weird when you see it. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, yeah, somehow a bit relate to that because I ask myself, um, like, how much of what we do or want to do we should consider as neo colonialism? Because, like, all these ideas about planting forests, of course, not uh, in uh, Western countries, but somewhere else. 
if right. some global south or even like doing research like going to a place collecting data and going back and and yeah what is your take on this like how much do we need to think about if we do a kind of neo colonialism or just like going on with this tradition of just taking things or asking others to do things that are difficult for us it seems like you've answered the question right that this is problematic right that and that as academics when we work in you know wherever we work in is that we work with the people of that land we work in collaboration we don't go there as experts that are going to produce some un unvarnished abstract truth about the world and so fundamentally i think especially when we work in different sets of communities academic practice has to shift as we are not always just the experts that are taking knowledge to the we have to have to work with people um and th that will produce a very different kind of knowledge system so i think you answered the question you were asking and i co i'm complete agreement with you that very often academia is very grounded in a neo colonial project of us as experts that are going to teach the world how to live when in fact our fields have been the source of the problem because they are colonial products So there are a lot of questions I might have missed some. So feel free to just point it if I have not answered, if I've missed something. I think there's one question that has been uh, asked again about the um, botanical gardens. Um, yeah, it's written maybe a very general question, but thinking about the history of botanic gardens and botany and coloniality. Yes. What do you feel should be the future of botanic gardens or whether they should have a future at all? So I think of botanical gardens much like museums. They're plant museums. And there's a lot of work in um, you know, museum studies that are trying to decolonize the museum, right? Of um, um, asking questions about um, who who gave permission to pull something from one part of the world to another part of the world um what what kind of work are these botanical gardens trying to do and very often they started as colonial projects to bring interesting plants from the rest of the world and house them here as really a science you know as a sign of the of colonial power um and i i and also in museum studies it's also about re-narrating so botanical gardens can be um, become a project talking about um, you know colonialism and botany can become a site of telling those histories rather than here is X plant here is Y plant all with their Linnaean classification system which is usually you know what is done uh, and it's these abstract plants that have no histories that belong nowhere um, and that we're all supposed to memorize and say oh this one has pinnate leaves this has compound leaves this has red flower you know this this is what botany is is really a recitation of these sets of facts and so i think botanical gardens can become something different much like what museums are trying to do to the inheritance of um you know, really of pillage from colonial times where things were taken without permission and now they're being housed um, as um, representative, representatives of colonial nations and usually how backward they were, right? Or how primitive they were. Um, and so I think we need a different kind of narration of plants, much like museum studies is trying to do to anthropology. There was another question in the chat, um, which is, uh, how did you make the jump uh, from evolutionary biology to feminist and science studies? Um, there's this long question, really into Sophie has about, um, I love the idea of the agricultural humanities. I had not heard about that. 
will become more. I, I, yes, I have a lot of hope that it will become more interdisciplinary, mostly because of all of you, right? Increasingly, I feel when I give talks, there are more undergraduates and graduate students doing this work. Uh, and so you are starting asking these questions and you're bringing together knowledge at so much earlier stage than many of us who, you know, went to do it way past um, our PhD. So I, I am very hopeful because of all of you and the questions you're asking and the kind of activism you're doing, you know, this early so that by the time you finish your studies that you will ask more interesting questions and produce more interesting knowledge about the world. So how did I come to do this? So I, um, you know, grew up in India, as I said, in a, a very science focused um, curriculum, which is how, you know, thanks to the British, again, a colonial legacy. And, um, um, and so I think, I think, and I, during graduate, well, I'd never been outside of India. So, you know, it was quite a cultural, you know, culture shock. And so I was feeling very alienated within the department. And that's when I met someone in women's studies and started reading the literature on um, women in science and feminism and science. And it just opened up a new world, right? That it wasn't just about, okay, that science is not diverse in terms of who practices science, but there's a reason for that. And it is these longer histories. And so once I began reading them, it, I sort of felt I could not go back and do a biology which did not understand these histories. And so much, much of my work is really about trying to figure out how might I do experimental biology, understanding these cultural um, histories and the histories of colonialism. So that's really what my, um, my quest or my work is about. Well, that so sounds really great about the, what Tiago is saying about um, the colonial history of bot botanic gardens and the zoo. That's great. Okay, there's another question. I will read it. Um, in my PhD in organic agriculture, I am suggesting a new research field, the agrarian humanities, but I am really in favor of the idea that questions and topics I want to be taught in this field should be discussed, discussed within the agriculture universities and not in the humanities, so only in the humanities. Do you have the hope or at least the utopian dream that also the sciences should become more interdisciplinary? interdisciplinary meaning that, meaning that there will be a history of science classes in each agricultural curriculum or career ecology or post-colonial theory classes and biology departments yeah so yeah i'm i am very hopeful as i said because of all of you and one of my suggestions so this you know happened to a lot of us in graduate school who were interested none of our professors are really qualified to teach this right because they you know a lot of the interdisciplinary work you're doing may not exist in your department and so i suspect this is why your group formed I, I don't know the history of your group but i so i so i think you need to go find the resources wherever they are in the university or create groups like this invite people whose work interests you and so if your you know if your department doesn't have it and i don't know sometimes you can talk to the faculty who may create courses like that they may invite other people to teach those courses um, but I'm very hopeful um, that it may, it may take a long time, but I think, I, I don't see what else we can do. I think this work needs to happen. Um, we can't pretend we don't know the things we know. Um, I got a little confused in the chat, so I'm not really sure if there, is, if there are um, any Maybe other... you should just say if someone has put a question we've not gotten to just speak up. You sound like such an exciting group. And these questions are great. And also the kind of work all of you are doing, it seems... Uh... 
Yeah, we are also really happy about all the questions and we just thought there are so interesting guests here. So if any of the guests wants to kind of connect with us, you can always write an email to the Buzz for Weltwissenschaften. Maybe someone else from the group can put the email addresses or email address. Um, because yeah, I think also it's really good to, to have the context and to, to get in touch with people who are thinking about similar questions because it is not established in the university, at least not in the science, if you study something in the science. Um, yeah, so yeah, we are really happy that so many people came and that we could discuss and Sorry, Marlene. I think Alma has a question. She posted a star. This is sometimes a question. Yeah, Alma. Yeah, of course. I mean, I um, yeah, I don't need to end it. Okay. Um. Yeah. I have. I have a question. Thank you. Um. I'm not studying, but I'm just starting to. I'm trying to learn more about plants because I'm very interested in plants, and that means I'm also in the last month starting to learn a lot of the basics of botany. And I was wondering um, if you are still learn continuing to learn about plants, how your exploration of feminist science studies and of decoloniality um, has just influenced the way that you continue to learn about plants? So um, there's unfortunately no place you can go to do that. So I feel I am making, trying to make that knowledge myself. Right, so I read botany uh, through the histories of botany, through the anthropologies of botany. So really, this is something you have to put together for yourself. But there's so much great work in the history of botany, anthropology of botany, and the history of agriculture, of forestry, and the relationships between them. And I think we are going through a real revival at the moment of plant studies of humanists and environmental people in the environmental humanities and someone suggested agricultural humanities that are really taking on these questions of plants very seriously so it's it, to me it's everywhere at the moment of people thinking about this so i think you're doing this work at a good time Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we could end this year. Um, yeah, thank you, Vanu, so much again. It was very interesting. And yeah, hopefully we maybe will see each other again for another talk in the future. Thank you.